All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. We're over 10,000 now, million views and climbing. So make sure you do that. And if you want to ask questions of my guests or you want to see the interviews before anyone else, you can always sign up for the Patreon, which is in the description below. Okay, today on the show, a lot of people have uh, uh, big careers. They've done a lot of things. They have long discographies. Not many have one like my guest, Chuck Wright. Uh, he's got a lot to talk to, but also he has a brand new record out called Chuck Wright's Sheltering Sky, and it's available everywhere today. Link is in the description. So we're going to talk about his long career, Quiet Riot, Alice Cooper, House of Lords, Jafria, Full House. We're going to get into all that stuff. And more right after this. All right, please welcome Chuck Wright. Hello, everybody. I, I'm Chuck? sorry, I'm still laughing because of the Full House reference. <laughs> well, yeah, we're going to get into some Full House, but yeah, Chuck, I'm, I'm, really, <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Finally, yeah, right? Finally, and I'm glad you're here on the day of the release of your record, Chuck Yay! Wright. Yay! Even yeah. though it wasn't a plan, it just kind of happened, you know? Yeah, well, I want to just let people know real quick. Let's let's take a look at this first. This is why, Chuck, I, I, we're on a limited time because look at your uh, discography. This is just a part of it <laughs> and growing. So, oh, yeah. well, that's just, yeah. There's over 100 albums I've been a part of, yeah. And so. people can take a look right here. and You can go through these records and see some of your favorites. Uh, th th this is quite a quite a career, Chuck, as, as I said. So we, we won't be able to talk about every single record um, on the screen. Uh, no, but no. Nor do we but, want to. <laughs> yeah. And some of these you may have wanted uh, uh, to forget. Yeah, Ted Nugent record. The best thing about it is the album cover. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway. That's a good, yeah. So, okay, that's a, a good one, yeah, that we, we learned a little something about. <laughs> um, working with Ted Nugent, we, we, uh, it, it sounds like something maybe that would have been, uh, you could do without. Well, it, actually working with him was was an, an interesting uh, situation. Um, musically, not so much, but working with him, everything you've seen and heard, it's like that, but times 10. Um, mm -hmm. What was interesting is, uh, while I was playing bass for him, he's sitting there. And if I did any kind of, well, you play, so any kind of like grace notes to go around things, he had a pearl handle 45 that he would drop on the ground, which meant don't play that. So, mm. yeah, I know. And he had a stack of Polaroids of animals he's killed. And he had a bow and arrow that he would take outside during breaks. We'd be shooting hoops and he'd be like shooting a full scale deer in the, that he set into the bushes it was a, I'll never forget it. Tom Werman was involved and my, my dear friend who passed some years ago, uh, John Purdell was co-producing and engineering and worked on the album. And he's been part of my, he was a part of my life for a long, long time and was working on that album. Yeah. Doesn't sound like fun to me, but what do I know? Well, it, it, it was interesting. <laughs> I don't, you know, yeah, Ted's a fun guy. I, I can't say he's not, he's it's never a dull moment. But anyway, I only pointed that out because that album cover um, and the title of the album, which is "If You Can't Lick 'Em, Lick 'Em," is a pretty good title. So, yes, no, anyway. uh, for sure. Chuck, going all the way back, I heard you say uh, you were talking about your bass influences, and I thought this was great. Uh, they all start with the letter J. They actually do. In fact, I did a post today because it's Jack Bruce's birthday. And I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdotal story about that in a second. But I started thinking about it. And I go, all the bass players when I started, so Jack Bruce, um, um, John Paul Jones, mm -hmm. one of my favorite, uh, Ramble On and uh, what, what Is It What Should Never Be, amazing bass uh, parts, um, John Whistle. And then I got into Fusion a little bit, Jeff Berlin and Jaco Pastorius. And then I thought about who was like the original one that really inspired me, and it was Paul McCartney. But his real name is James Paul McCartney. So we got a J in there. Anyway. And we um, forgot we forgot the great James Jamerson, too. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm sorry. He's the one that started it all, right, with the, with the soulfulness of the bass playing. Um, the interesting story with the Jack Bruce bass, um, the first bass I ever got was uh, uh, Gibson 83 because that's what Jack played. 
I first song I learned was Sunshine of Your Love. And then cut to I'm on tour with Vanilla Fudge. And the bass player in the opening act inherited a lot of money and, and happened to have a music room co uh, collection. And I went to it and he had the bass that Jack Bruce played, Sunshine of Your Love, at his house. And I got to play that bass that I learned my first song. So that's a full circle story. Full yeah. circle for sure. Yeah. And, and, and how cool. So you got your first bass. You're starting to learn how to play. Are, are you self-taught? I'm totally self-taught. Um, in fact, I've never taken a lesson. My my schoolroom was being blessed to be here in L.A. where I, I got to see bands like Black Sabbath at the Whiskey, Yes at the Whiskey, Genesis at the Roxy, um, David Bowie's first concert, Queens did two shows back to back. I saw them. And that was my I absorbed all of that, you know, just watching the production of the shows to the, you know, the musicianship. And that was kind of how what what I got. I was like a sponge, you know, back then with all of that. And that's where I, that's kind of my, you know, it's more old school, but that's what I did. I didn't want to become somebody else's. A lot of guys I, I know that go to um, like Berkeley or, or MIT or places like that, they kind of all come out the same. And I really always wanted to have my own approach and my own feeling when I played, you know, not that getting the, the full education is, is a, isn't a bad thing, but I yeah. think you need to play from, inside and, and learning cream songs in the beginning when I first started playing was really important because it was all about improvisation. So I had to create my own things. Yeah. And, and, uh, and what's so great about the full circle again in your life is that you'll go on to play those venues where you saw the people who influenced you. And you'll also play with a lot of these people in, in your career. That's right. And, and in fact, um, the whiskey a go, go, which is legendary as you probably know, the doors with the house band there, that's where I have my weekly, well, it's now every two weeks, um, event Ultimate Jam Night, where I, I bring together 45 to 100 professional musicians in a different themed show, um, you know, uh, each time, whatever it's going to be. Um, we just did a benefit for Ukraine and raised a bunch of money for the um, for the um, World Cent Central Kitchen. And um, we're about to do a uh, Britain Rock show, which... After looking at all the great artists that came out of Britain, I'm going to be doing this is part one. There's going to be many more parts to it. Um, so it's a different theme each week. And last week we had um, uh, the big four. So it was Anthrax and Megadeth and Metallica. And, and uh, you know, all the heavy rocker guys came out. It was a blast. Um, yeah. You Dave, know. Elson, Dave Elson was there. And, you know, it, it, it's pretty cool. You've it's kept cool. that going since, I, mean, I think, 2015? We started at another venue in 2015, and, and then we outgrew it. And, now we're at the Whiskey A Go-Go. And Mikey, the owner of the Whiskey, when I first met with him, said, you know, residencies don't really work at the Whiskey. They never really have. Um, but I'll give you a couple weeks. And we've been there since, you know. So we had to take off. Obviously, we took off 17 months, I think, uh, for the pandemic. But we're back now. Yeah. And people can check that out. You can check out everything at ChuckWright.com. All the yeah. links and things you're involved with. And, and then social media as well. That's true. Um, UltimateJamNight.com too. You can get some background on what that is. Yeah, it, being at the whiskey is such a uh, experience. I think sometimes people don't understand, uh, don't respect the history as much. Maybe they don't know. You're young. You go and oh, the whiskey. But when you look around that venue and you look around at who played there and some of the most amazing stories with the uh, Doors and Van Halen. I, I like to show people. See this spot right here. This is this is where Jim Morrison urinated on the crowd, <laughs> <laughs> right over the balcony. <laughs> Crazy. There's a lot of crazy stuff that's gone on at that place. And, and you were probably involved in some of it. Yeah. Um, back in the old days, we used, um, I was in, which became uh, the Mental Health Cry Riot. I was in Dubrow and we did a show there with Motley Crue and neither one of us had a record deal. It was, and it was just crazy. It was packed and it, just insanity. You kind of felt that things were going to start going that direction, you know, just by the intensity of the crowds that were coming out for it. Yeah, for sure. Chuck, let's talk a little bit about that early lineup because Quiet Riot exists. Most people know they have the two records that uh, were only available in Japan. Randy Rhodes is on them. Kelly Garney's the first bass player. Uh, Rudy Sarzo comes in uh, on the second uh, record, or at least the, the touring of it. And then uh, Randy Rhodes goes off to Ozzy at that point. Uh, and uh, the point, you're, you're in the band Debro, right, after Quiet Riot. Well, one of, the, one of the things I've always wanted to set straight with, with people that they don't really get 
is that there are two completely different quiet riots. Um, one is the Randy Rhodes era thing. And the only reason the mental health uh, ban became quiet riot again is because the record label gave us two choices for names, which was Annie Hampton and Wild Oscar. And Kevin said, no, 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 no. I'll just call it quiet riot again if that's going to be my choice. So it really, the mental health era and, and then on really didn't really have anything to do with um, the first two quiet riot albums, except for the name itself. Uh, musically, it was different. And it's, you know, basically uh, Kevin's the one thread, the voice that really uh, followed through. Um, yeah. I like that you say that because I've always thought that too. You have these people who are sort of purists who argue about this. Yeah, but yeah. To me, the band that you saw on MTV is the metal health lineup. And that is the band that people discovered. And for me and many people, that's where it begins. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that is really where that quiet riot began. There was another one. That, that had a couple of records out, I guess, in Japan with Randy and but but the mental health one is is the one. Yeah. So in so in between, you're playing with Kevin. You knew Kevin. For, how do you first meet Kevin? Actually, um, I had a band um, in the late seventies into the early eighties called Satter, which was a more of a prog rock band. If you can imagine, Led Zeppelin meets Genesis. We had. Mm -hmm. Costume changes. We were the first band in rock and roll history to have a laser show. We knew a guy that developed a technology up at Pasadena Tech and, um, you know, shooting it off the, the mirrors. And we also had a rear screen put behind us where he projected things. And we had stages set up that looked like flying saucers for the keyboards and, and the drums. And that, that keyboard player went on to produce uh, Kiss and, and uh, Mr. Big and, and uh, Deep Purple, Richie Blackmore. Uh, his name is Pat Regan. He was the keyboard player in that thing. But that guitar player started working with his Bob Steffens, his name. He started working with Kevin in Dubrow after Randy and Rudy. You know, I mean, I guess Rudy was still playing, but uh, um, and he joined the band. And then and then when Rudy left, uh, they suggested me or he suggested me to, to uh, join the band. But they at first were hesitant because of being a prog guy. They didn't think that I'd be a good fit. But, you know, I love Humble Pie, Ze Zeppelin, bands like that, too. So uh, once once Kevin heard me play, I was in. So that's how that all started. And then we did the demos um, that became the Metal Health record. And, and a lot of that stuff is, is are the demos on that album. Like Bang Yeah. And so that lineup of Dubrow, who else is in the band? Is it the guys that will – is it Frankie and Carlos? Um, Actually, it was, it was Frankie. Frankie came in and out of the band a bunch of times, but um, – on that last bit, Frankie and um, and Bob Steffen, myself and Kevin, and then Bob had a meltdown at a gig, and Kevin goes, "I can't deal with that. Let's try to find somebody else." And I said, "Hey, that guy in Snow is really great. You know, I don't know if you're familiar, but he, he had a band, a band called Snow, and um, they actually had a song called No More Booze, which mm -hmm. Kevin really liked. And uh, the story with that, if you've heard the song, it goes, no more booze, what a drag, right? Which became Bang Your Head. Now, the, how Bang Your Head came about was Kevin got a phone call from Randy um, when he was in, in England talking about the shows. And he goes, yeah, the kids over here are doing this thing called Banging Heads. They're all like banging their heads up and down. And so Kevin, in his mind, he goes, oh, that's a great title. I'm going to use that title. And then the mental health thing came, obviously, was a good choice because mm -hmm. it's a metal song and for your good health, you know, or whatever, your mental health. Um, so he, the, Kevin's totally responsible for that whole phrase, but the song with Carlos written song um, musically um, before. So let's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great story. I've heard it. Carlos was on the show. I think it's the only interview. Yeah, I think it's the only interview he's done in 10 years or more. Uh, yeah, he's so. kind of, he, yeah, he kind of keeps himself. <laughs> no yeah, no, no social media uh, oh. and really avoids. You won't return uh, phone calls either. <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we'll get him to do that. Uh, but he yeah. does avoid uh, uh, drama too, which is sometimes a good thing, I think. Oh, yeah, the, okay, I try. Yeah. Uh, well, and but being involved in the band Quiet Riot, drama sometimes um, su uh, surrounds it, uh, that, that, that brand. Uh, I so think, talk, you know, I think if you watch the movie that was out on uh, Showtime for two years, uh, now you're here, there's no way back. Uh, you'll see a lot of everything that transpired from the beginning to when we um, were trying to find a lead singer after Kevin passed. Yeah, the, the movie definitely uh, gives a good idea of what, what yeah. everyone 
has been through. It after the movie, though, it still continues. Uh, and, and, it, and it kept continuing. Yeah. And, yeah. And, until Jizzy came back. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so talk about it. So you're recording, like you said, these were supposed to be demos, and well, they were demos, but they were good. So if you can't, you know, if it's not broken, why fix it, right? So when you play you, your your vocals are on all the songs, background vocals on that record, right? Yeah, and that's kind of the sound. So when they went to do Condition Critical, they had me come back in and um, and sing along with them again to get that same sound. It was a blend. We we the way he, we did the vocals then was. Carlos, Kevin, and I all sang the same note. Like we'd start in the middle and then we'd do an upper one and then we'd do a lower one. And that's kind of how it was built. And I remember the producer, Spencer Prophet, or Proffer, I call him Spend Your Profits. But anyway, mm -hmm. he he uh, he would have us just sing his heart like pirates. He goes, okay, more like a pirate, you know, all the time. And just like really gruff and hard and and uh, I always left every session, vocal session, with a migraine. Just after, just trying to sing like Kevin for for five or six hours is is not an easy task. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, lo lo those are some long hours too. Um, so you you record those demos as we were saying. Uh, you know, the "Bang Your Head" song that we all hear. You play bass on it. That is a demo, right? Yes. Uh huh. Initially, that was that was uh, one of the songs that we cut. Um, and there were other ones, you know, too. Uh, Don't want to let you go. Um, mm -hmm. It's still on the album, which was my base, my base work on it. But yeah, what? Uh, so you're going to go through this in your career three times with Rudy Sarzo. It's an odd uh, thing. I think, I think it's actually five. I, I mean, I have to. I have. To, I know I've been in and out of the band five times, at least five times for various reasons, but you know, this time was, you know, he wanted to come back. And so um, I'm working on my solo thing and, and I've got- well, let's, talk about, yeah, let's talk about the first one. Um, I don't even you, remember. Oh, the, you mean- oh. Well, you, you record the demos and then um, obviously there's the there's the plane crash, Randy Rhodes tragically passes away, right? Mm -hmm. And then how did they tell you, we're gonna bring Rudy back? Well, what happened was, um, they all got together again at, at um, Randy's funeral and I wasn't able to go to it. Uh, so I wasn't there. And I guess they reconnected then and then they talked about it and, and um, you know, they said, Hey, if you come back, we can be quite riot again. And, and at the time, like I said, I had my own band where I was the songwriter for everything and we were packing it wherever we played. So Carlos called me and said, Hey, listen, Rudy's going to rejoin. I said, Oh, okay. Well, you know, at that time, honestly, that kind of music was not in vogue at all. I never thought in a million years it would sell, you know, 10 million copies, maybe 10,000. I never ever would think it would have done the, what it did, you know. Uh, but Come On, Feel the Noise is what broke broke the doors open for everybody. A song that, they, that Kevin didn't actually want on the record. Exactly. I remember arguing with Spencer, the producer, and, and uh, Kevin. And I kept, I said to Kevin, I go, listen, I go, listen to the whole album. Do you hear anything that sounds like a CHR, you know, contemporary hit radio song? Do you hear anything on here? I go, you got to step back, be honest about it. I go, this is a pretty strong tune. It's got a great hook. And so we argued with him and he finally caved in and um, did it, you know, as much yeah. as he did to do it. He wanted to keep everything, you know, within the band. And obviously that song, yeah, as you said, breaks quiet riot into well i think it broke it it changed the fabric of the whole music scene it, it that song was so huge that every label decided hey let's sign every band that has long hair you know and that's a uh in that same kind of hard rock style and that's what they did and you know bands like the knack the motels the fix on and on they all just kind of faded away just like we faded away when nirvana hit the scene you know it's the same kind of cyclical thing that happens yeah, and this becomes first record to uh, have a first heavy metal record, number one on the Billboard charts, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm honored to say that, yeah, part of that history, you know, whether it be a footnote or not, whatever it is, at least, uh, yeah, I, I was part of that whole thing, the first me uh, metal record to go number one on Billboard Top 100. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to point out to everyone, uh, you are on, you're doing quite the media all day. You've got interviews, you're promoting Chuck Wright, Sheltering Sky. So you don't wake up and go, let me tell that Quiet Riot story again. So I, I thank you for well, doing this. 
that's okay. That's not a, a, not that many people are really talking that much about that as much as what about the album and what I'm doing and 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 other people that I've worked with like Alice Cooper or Greg Allman or or you know different people. But that's well, cool. I want to wrap up on the Quiet Ride stuff because I do want to talk about some of those other things. And of course, I want to talk about um, this brand new record that is available everywhere today. Link is in the descriptions. So, Chuck, it, as you said, you've been in and out of Quiet Ride a few times. It seems like Rudy leaves. He gets another gig. He comes back. Um, and at the end of 2021, they make the decision again. Uh, and at this point, there are no original members of Quiet Riot. The only person who was involved in the mental health lineup is yourself um, cool. at that point. And, uh, and so it's Jizzy Pearl uh, singing again, Alex Grassi on guitar, um, yourself on bass, and Frankie, um, who's obviously passed away, uh, Johnny Kelly from Typo Negative on drums, and you were going out and touring. They make a decision to bring Rudy back again. How do you find out about that? Well. The just hang on, I got a, I've got a bird making a lot of noise here. That was actually Keith Emerson's bird. Hang on, Keith Emerson's bird. We wouldn't know. Anyway, um, yeah, um, that was you know it was a management decision, and and I really can't. I'm not. I'm told I can't really talk about it, so I can't really get in any kind of details um, about all of that. But you know, he wanted to come back. I'm busy doing my own thing. I've got a lot of other things going on as always. So, you know, it is what it is. It actually, yeah. I, you know, I've been playing with the band since uh, we started back and then we, with Kevin, and then, you know, we took uh, some time off after he passed and Frankie started back up in 2011 or the end of 2010, I think it was. And, um, and I've been going nonstop with uh, quite right. Even during the pandemic, we were out there playing, we were doing Sturgis or whatever, but so, you know, a break from it now is not a bad thing. And, and I know that you did your best to keep it amicable. Um, everyone did. You, the, when, the no, when the notice went out publicly that Rudy would be coming back, there were still shows on the books that you finished out. Um, I can't speak for you, but I feel I can pardon my language. You must be thinking, what the fuck, Rudy Sarzo again? Uh, but I can't speak for you. Uh, you know, it, it, like I've said before, it, it doesn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me. And because it's happened before, it, it is what it is. And like I said, I'm, I'm on to other kinds of things, especially um, when people hear this album, you'll see how, how different musically and uh, really what I'm about than, than that. You know, that, that music's the 80s and I'm doing my own thing now. This record is completely different. Last question about that era of Quiet Riot. Do you think that you'll ever see Carlos Cavazzo back in that band? Uh, I really can't say. I, I mean, I haven't really spoken to Carlos in a very long time. Um, and, you know, like I said, he doesn't return calls or whatever, but with, to anybody, not just me, but that's mm -hmm. just him. Um, I, I don't really know. I really can't. I can't say. Yeah, it seems like, you know, I understand that they think by having the mental health lineup, they'll bring Rudy in. And I think while Carlos is out there, you know, he talks about it in the interview here. People can watch it where he talked, him and Frankie had some some issues and things. And so who knows, maybe yeah, it seemed like a lot. So maybe they can work that uh, that out. Okay, anyway, that, uh, the, the Quiet Riot thing ends for you again. Uh, but as you said, it really was the perfect time. It really um, is. It's it's time. You know, the time is now. Everything the stars have aligned uh, for it all to come happen right now. And even with some of the songs on my album, that the stars have aligned. I, there's a my new single that's out. It's called Throwing Stones. Mm -hmm. it has an anti-war message, but the lyric was written before the Russian invasion. So when I created this video, I kind of tied all that together. But the lyric uh, was by Joe Retta, who you might know from the Sweet and Dio Disciples and uh, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, he wrote it, the lyrics to it and the vocal melodies to the music. And and the timing on that is amazing. Chuck, when, when, uh, when I first heard the first single, um, I thought to myself, okay, Chuck is gonna put out a, a heavy metal record. He's gonna put out a record that sounds like Quiet Riot and, it'll, and that is not what you put out. That doesn't mean- you didn't put out, I mean. yeah. 
Go ahead. Yeah. You know, you have an amazing product, but I think people, uh, if you're expecting another Quiet Riot record or, or, or House of Lords, that, that's not what this is. Uh, it's also a record filled with guest performers. There's over 40 uh, guests on it and a lot of brand name guys, but the sounds of the songs are different. This is a collection of music uh, to right. me. And, you, and maybe it's not the kind of record that you're always going to listen to from start to finish. You, there's, there's certain songs maybe you'll vibe with um, because they are different. And the first two singles show that. I really like that you've incorporated video with the music because, uh, uh, and people can watch those videos, uh, but it really sells the, the, the song and the message. I, I agree with you 100%. Now, I got to tell you, this whole thing was not, it was, it was never a plan. I just, when the pandemic hit, it allowed me time to finally sit down and start composing again. <clears throat> and and uh, looking at the world, with all, it was like a, a post-apocalyptic feeling with all the empty streets. I sat down and wrote um, uh, the first song, which is called Weight of Silence. And I did a video for it. And there's footage of empty streets, like I was saying, of, like New York City, nobody there. And um, I put that out myself. And Troy Lucetta from Tesla uh, reached out to me. And he goes, man, can I play drums on that? That song's so cool. You know, six, eight time, perfect. You know, so... I said, you know, I haven't ever thought about that. I go, but sure, give it, you know, he has a studio. I go, go for it. It killed. And then a, a guitar player that I, I love here in LA, who's a top jazz fusion guy named Alan Hines, added guitar to it and it became a whole new thing. And then Derek Sherinian, who you might know from Dream Theater and, and um, a couple, uh, Sons of Apollo, mm -hmm. um, added some Mellotron and, and strings to it and it, it turned into a different thing. And that song just I just found out yesterday won um, best instrumental and best video for the um, hard rock you know the um, rock music alliance yeah the rock music alliance awards this is yeah. a great award. before the record comes out you yeah. win these two awards and uh, as I was saying before we went on yeah you beat out some pretty stiff competition you weren't up against uh, no names and well yeah there's what yeah there's a few you know Satriani and John Five I guess were on there but uh, I. I hold in high regard both of those guys. So yeah, it came as a surprise, and the timing's great because the album's out today, as you said. And um, uh, just it, it's all things are like you said, the stars are lining. Now's the time, is a good time for me to be doing my own thing. Had you ever thought about this before? I'm no, sorry. actually, like I said, this was not. I just was writing music that I wanted to hear, that I like, would want to listen to, and that's why on the album you've got all the, you know different genres: jazz fusion, funk progressive stuff. I even have a full on Celtic piece of a song that, that I've loved since I was a kid called Darkness, Darkness by a band called Youngbloods. It came out in 1969. And David Victor, who sang with uh, Boston, did the vocal on it. And it's, it's freaking amazing. And it sounds like it could be in a, a new Braveheart movie or something, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard it. So you know what I'm talking about. It's it, it the, I, the album as a whole kind of is it's like a cinematic adventure to me when you listen to it top to bottom it takes you through so many different uh, moods and well and you talk about being a composer i mean i think some people may think chuck wright is a, a rock bassist but there's much more to that and you know you've composed yeah. for movies and and you've worked with so many other people you know your discography showed some of that um but so for you to make a rock it makes sense that you wouldn't have just made a rock record you've played in tons of rock bands this was something to show all those different styles um, that you're involved with. Right. Yeah. I, I've done, been very fortunate to cover a lot of different territory musically, which that's what I'm about. I like, I'm in, if it's done well, I'm into it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and this covers a lot of that territory. And like, and there's something for everybody. There's different music for different people. And then also um, there's all kinds of great, um, guests who appear on this record as well. And, and you can tell us some of the, you know, you can't name well, all 40. Well, no, you know, it's it, what I did was, is, let's say there's a certain part, I go, you know what would be great? Scotty Hill from my, my friend from Skid Row, he would sound brilliant on this solo section. So I reached out to him and said, hey, I've got this song I'm doing. Would you be into like laying something down? And he did it. Same thing with, with a lot of the people that are on, you know, um, one of my favorite singers in rock and roll is Jeff Scott Soto, who I met um, back in the day. Um, he was singing with Ingve Malmsteen, but he's, you know, he's uh, Trans Siberian Orchestra and his solo stuff. He was even in Journey, and I sent and he and I know because he's a friend 
I know that he loves R and B and funk kind of music a lot, and he sings the crap out of it. So I said, Jeff, check this tune out. You want to, you know, you want to throw some vocals on it. And he just, and within a few hours, he sent it back, and I wouldn't have changed anything. It was amazing. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's. Be, I think a lot of also we we should mention is because of the jam night, you were yeah. working with so many different uh, musicians. You know that. It may, you know, obviously worked with a ton of people that you played with, but maybe through the jam night, you're meeting all kinds of other guys. That Yeah, there's been well over 2,000 or more musicians in and out, and I, and I have um, built relationships with a lot of them and kept in touch and then have them back. And yes, there are many people on the album that have uh, become a good friend of mine through meeting them um, at Ultimate Jam Night, definitely. Yeah, and uh, what a, what a, what a, a pool of talent you you have to uh, pick from. Oh yeah, it's it's crazy, definitely. And uh, now this is not necessarily the kind of project that you take on the road. Um, do you have plans to do something live? Though? You know, to to fulfill what my vision would be for this thing, I would need Roger Waters or Paul mm -hmm. McCartney's budget. You know, with the total immersion experience and having all the musicians, I need to do it because when you listen to the record, it's pretty thick with what's going on there with, with different types. I, one song, I have five guitar players on it. Mm -hmm. And there's the album cover. Uh, the album cover, by the way, uh, people, was done by my, my very close friend, Glenn Wexler, who you've probably seen his work with Van Halen, uh, Rush, Black Sabbath, and a, a huge, huge list of people. And, and, um, Though I've done a lot of graphic design in my life, I used to I worked for three labels doing album covers and packaging. Um, when he when the best says, "Hey, I'd I'd be into doing your your project with you. You really love the music," and and he did it. Yeah, and and uh, a great uh, cover. So let's make sure we remind people. Chuck Wright's "Sheltering Sky" is available right now through Cleopatra Records. There's a link yeah. in the description, so you can go to that link. Uh, it's available on CD and uh, also download, of course. And then you can also go to chuckwright.com and you can check out um, all his things. I heard you say, though, that you were thinking maybe of doing like a filming, like a live version, like a video incorporated live kind of DVD thing. I've thought about a few different things. I mean, uh, with Ultimate Jam Night, for instance, we have multiple cameras down there. Um, and I was thinking about coming in and doing a few songs and filming it that way or going into the studio and filming some things. Um, and I've also thought about taking a more streamlined version and some songs off of this and some songs from my past that would be able to, to be done uh, with less people involved, you know, a more stripped down version. But uh, like I said, to do what's on this record would take a lot. Mm -hmm. As people discover when they hear the whole thing. Well, and it's exciting because as of today, we'll start hearing, you know, uh, reviews have already been coming in. Uh, you know, critics have re reviewed this and uh, obviously overwhelmingly positive. Uh, but it was be, pretty great so far, yeah. I think it'll be really, you know, obviously fun for the uh, for you to hear from the fans who who are going to get a hold of this and uh, and enjoy that. Now, we're talking about music from your past. Were you thinking about uh, ha having anything from Hot Daddy and the Monkey Puppets? <laughs> In the set. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Revolution Mind actually is a pretty great song that we we start the show. Now in the '90s, um, you know, being a, a good friend of Lanny's, he was one of his best friends was John Stamos, and John decided in the in this season that he wanted a new lineup, a new band. Like he got fired from his own band, or what? I forgot what the circumstances was, but but I came in as the new bass player, and it, the band was named by the the uh, Olsen one of the Olsons is, is the monkey puppets. And that's how that came about. The concept for this show was he wanted to show uh, Lori Laughlin his great life, glamorous life on the road, which it certainly was not. And we ended up um, going to this club we're supposed to play. And, and the guy says, hey, uh, where's all your, your polka outfits and polka gear? And John goes, well, what are you talking about? We're a rock band. He goes, no, no, no. Tonight I have a busload of people coming in. It's polka night. And we ended up getting dressed up in lederhosen and doing I Want to Rock and Roll All Night, the Kiss mm -hmm. song, as a polka, which is it's pretty funny. You can find it on YouTube if you want a good laugh. At my expense, go for it. It is on YouTube. I have I saw the episode in my own life. I remember it. It's one of the funnier episodes of the show. Uh, yeah. As you said, Lanny Cordola, who was in uh, House of Lords with you, 
Yeah. He was in the original Jesse and the Rippers uh, lineup. Yeah. And then also uh, Ken Mary, who's been on this show, he also played drums at one point with uh, Jesse and the Rippers. And yeah, so this- Ken's on my album too, by the way, um, you know, both Ken and Lanny. Ken actually mixed uh, one of the songs as well. Yeah, a, a lot of talented guys and a lot of talented musicians involved in this fun show. This episode doesn't seem so far-fetched. I think a lot of bands who went on tour when they had to go back out in the modern day find that the venues have changed and the hotels have changed. Oh, yeah, things are way different. It used to, you know, you think, wow, this used to be great. What happened? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's different. All of a sudden they tell you, oh, you're going to be playing the arena, but then you find out you're playing the, the, the parking lot of the arena or... or the venue that, now- happened. that happened. We were going to play with, uh, we were playing in Mexico with Guns N' Roses, and we go, oh, this is great. And we get there. We're out in the parking lot area. <laughs> but you know what? There was probably 15,000 people out there just going crazy. So it was fine, but I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. And then there's your your bowling alleys. All of a sudden, the venue has a bowling alley or a, or a, there was a laundromat, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, all, all of the different scenarios have happened. My, one of my favorite Kevin DeBro quotes, and I say it all the time to bands that I work with, it, uh, they, I believe they were playing a nudist uh, colony at the time. I don't, did you I, do that one? I missed that one. I'm lucky I missed it. <laughs> you, you probably lucked out. But he said, sometimes you play to millions of people and sometimes you play to multiple people. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it does happen that way sometimes. Right. Mm. Yeah, you never know. I mean, whatever whatever it is, and Kevin instilled this in me from back in the day. If if it's a hundred people or ten thousand people or fifty thousand people, you still give them the, the same show. You give it a hundred percent, and you know, go all out. Sometimes it's hard to play for a smaller crowd because everybody's right there on top of you watching you. You know, but uh, as opposed to huge thousands of people, where you can't see the people as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean? if they're far away. It's a little yeah. easier when you're looking in your face all night. It may they're be like they're scrutinizing every little thing. <laughs> yeah. So Chuck, what's the plan? We know the record's out. We know that people can uh, get it right now. What's next? I know the Ultimate Jam Night continues as well. Yeah, I'm doing that. I'm also, um, I I started playing with uh, my friend Greg D'Angelo, who's the original drummer from White Lion, and Terry Luce, singer from Great um, Great White, um, who's also recently, a couple years ago, I think, was was left the band. And uh, we we do a thing called uh, Legends of Classic Rock. And we play songs from our different guys' repertoire. And um, that's we're actually doing a show um, on the 26th um, out in Palm Springs. But that's something I'm doing for fun live. And I also have my own band that I just played with a couple of nights ago uh, called Acoustic Saints with Stan Bush, who you might know. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we reinterpret classic rock things with violin and acoustic guitars and which is always a lot of fun. And I'm doing sessions. I have another uh, session tomorrow I have to do. So I'm always busy. Yeah, you're always busy. Now, I've had Greg and Terry on. They talked about that. They've both been on talking about the Legends of Class Rock, a really yeah. fun uh, a fun thing. And then also, uh, you're talking about the Acoustic Saints. This is some far out stuff. I remember I saw a video and I thought, okay, here comes uh, another unplugged thing. But that is not what it is. Uh, it, it's pretty cool. Yeah, we reinterpret the songs and and what what we like to do is take songs that are famous for the guitar part and he does it on fiddle even though he's an amazing guitar player we do eric johnson on acoustic but he rips on the fiddle so we'll we'll do like i'd love to change the world that um 10 years after alvin lee piece on violin that just rips or while my guitar gently weeps the beetle tune the, the song the song has guitar in the title and he's doing it on on violin which it's pretty awesome it's a great really great band i love playing with those guys yeah, it's really cool stuff. All this information is at chuckwright.com. Chuck, I got to have you back so that we can talk about Shafria, House of Lords. One of my favorites, Impelitary, Stand in Line. Yeah, well, I did a few Impelitary records, but yeah, the Stand in Line record with Pat Torpy, Graham Bonnet, um, it was was a, a interesting. I stepped, that's when I left, uh, uh, when Shortino was coming into Quiet Riot, I, that's when I left and started working with with Chris on the Impelitary record. And then I got the call from Greg about, hey, if we put a band together, a killer band together, uh, Gene Simmons will sign us to his RCA label. 
Um, and that's when we put together House of Lords. So that's how, how that'll happen. But Santa yeah. Love's a pretty rocking record, man. Yeah, I like it. And uh, uh, great players on there, too. And then uh, we'll talk about it next time. But Gene also would then produce the Doro Pesh, second Doro Pesh record. Another famous album. I just had Doro on the show. One of the nicest people. You yeah, could that's great. Before. Yeah, he had me play on that. Uh, the, the odd thing about it, though, is nobody's listed on what track, so nobody knows who did what on that album. <laughs> it's kind you of that was a, uh, the, Gene made that decision on purpose. I don't know. There's like four different bass players, and I, you know, it's like unless you know what's what, you have no idea who played what, you know. But I remember yeah. that session; it was great. That's something Pat. Uh, I told you earlier about Pat Regan, who was the keyboard player in my band. He actually was involved in that album as well. There's a lot of uh, these parallels in your career with people who. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, tons of it, crossing paths all the time. Yeah. So anyway, Chuck, we'll come. We'll have you come back next time. We'll talk about some new things. Hopefully, next time we'll be talking about how popular record is, how well it's doing. Yeah. How you mean how this? Doing. Yes, this. There it is right there. there That's the first there. physical copy right there, and uh, more awards and more positive reviews and. Uh, Look forward to people seeing it. We'll talk about it more on my show, on the live show. Uh, so Chuck Wright's Sheltering Sky. It's available now. Link in the description, chuckwright.com. Thanks, Chuck. I appreciate you spending some time with me. Thank you, Jason. It's been fun. Okay. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye, everybody.